Next, I would like to introduce our uh, second thought leadership spotlight. Um, it's entitled Go Beyond Resumes, how you can democratize the recruiting process to hire better, uh, more diverse talent, which will help us develop a fresh approach to bring more diverse candidates into your talent pipeline. Um, so please welcome to the stage Tigran Sloyan. Tigran is co-founder and CEO of CodeSignal. So let's welcome Tigran. Right. Hello, everybody. I got to make sure I don't fall on these chairs if I do. <laughs> make sure to catch a foot. <laughs> uh, great to be here. It's kind of exciting because last time I did an in-person talk like this, it was like exactly two years ago before COVID. So it's kind of interesting, you know, to be seeing people's faces, hearing reactions versus everybody on mute. Uh, <laughs> asking, can you please unmute? Interact. Uh, anyways, excited to be here. As the you know slide says, I'm here to talk to you about going beyond resumes. But before we start, let's do a quick uh, poll together. You know, uh, who here agrees with me that resumes are a terrible way to identify and hire talent? All right, my type of crowd. So <laughs> almost everybody. Uh, see. This is what's interesting, because almost all of us, from our personal experiences, have seen either somebody who was incredible, who couldn't get an opportunity to interview, either we felt it on our own experience, right? Where we've been passed on because somebody looked at our resume and said, I don't think you're quite qualified for this job, even though you 100% were. Uh, before I get into it, though, I'd love to start off by telling you my own story of how I came into realizing how bad resumes are and how it really, really needs a change. So I grew up in Armenia, which is a really, really small country in Eastern Europe. And growing up, you know, it was kind of a tough situation in Armenia, not the best place to grow up because it had just gained independence. It was like a newly formed country. It had managed to get into a war with a neighboring country over a territorial dispute which meant economic blockade. So there was no light, no heat. Uh, and one of my earliest memories when I'm literally five is going to a uh, nearby park. Like this is in the middle of the city, right? This is like going to Central Park or Golden Gate Park, or I don't know what's the big park in Seattle, but like literally going to one of these main parks with a snow sled and a saw because you're looking for a tree to cut uh, so that you can like put it on a sled, take it home and burn it so that you can get some heat. Uh, the funniest part is you couldn't even find a tree because all of them were already cut. So it was like hunting for trees, trying to figure out, you know, what are we gonna burn tonight? Uh, out of this, my father actually had this interesting theory that like no matter where you grew up, no matter how, you know, challenging the whole thing was, if you're really, really good at something, right? Like really absolutely good at something, uh, you'll find your place. There's no way you will get stuck and lost in the middle of it. That was a, I guess you can say, very you know, optimistic theory. Uh, but with that theory, he got me into math competitions at a fairly young age. So I started doing, initially I wasn't really into it, but I started doing math pretty much like nine hours a day, right? In the beginning, I was like, oh, this is, I hate this, this is not interesting. But the first time I went to a math competition and I saw, you know, nerdy looking kids like me getting diplomas and everything, I was like, hey, I can be one of them. And I'm very competitive by nature, so uh, really, really got into it. So eventually it was more like, you know, let me do another six, seven hours of math weekends, no matter what. By the time I was 12, I had literally won everything there was to win in the country. I was one of the top six uh, going to International Math Olympiads. Uh, by the time I was 16, literally the most decorated ever to this date, actually. If you go back, there's no one in Armenia uh, under the age of 18 who won more math competitions than I did. Sometime in 2000, yeah, very nerdy math kid. So, <laughs> so, so sometimes uh, at one of the math Olympiads, which was one of the, my last ones, you can only go until you're like 19. Uh, 
someone was like, hey, I'm going to MIT next year. So I'm like, what is MIT? I literally didn't know. And he writes on a sticky note, like mit.edu. And it's like, go apply. They love nerdy, you know, international math kids. <laughs> Uh, so I go apply, get in, full scholarship, move to Boston by myself, uh, and I was quite transformative as you can imagine, right? Like all of a sudden I was gearing up to have MIT on my resume, which changes many things, which at the time I didn't quite realize. It doesn't quite hit you until like the first career fairs where you've got an entire stadium full of recruiters that are, some of them are literally would give you the job on the spot if you're interested, like no interview necessary, right? Just the degree itself presumably is enough to get the job. Now, how this came in contact and help me realize that we've got to go beyond resumes. You've got to go back a little bit again and talk about another guy who's got a very similar story like me. His name is Aram. Uh, he's a co-founder of the, the company that we started, Code Signal, and he has a very similar story to mine. Grows up in the same period in Armenia, goes through the same cutting trees with a snow sled period. Uh, his father was a programmer, one of those, you know, when computers were like a gigantic room. Uh, where you had to like punch cards. I don't know if anybody has seen that, right? But like got him into programming in the beginning, just pen and paper under candle light. Eventually, when lights came on using computers, he wins the first silver medal from international programming competitions in Armenia, goes on to be by far the best engineer in the country. And then what happens is he's way more introverted than I am. So he doesn't quite hang out with as many international kids as I do. No one tells him about MIT and how you can literally apply, get in, and get full scholarship. And he ends up going to university in one of the local schools. And you can imagine what that leads to, right? Like once both of us graduate, I'm literally being chased by every recruiter in the country. And I end up working at Google, making way more money than any new grad should be making. And when I connect back with Aram, it turns out when he went out and tried to get a job, people would literally not bring him in for an interview. Because they would open up his resume, the resume would say, Yerevan State University, everybody would give, well, what is that, right? And you instantly just move on to the next candidate. So around 2013, while I was working at Google, he ends up essentially freelancing on Back then it was Odesk, now it's Upwork, because guess what? Uh, literally couldn't get an interview. And that was shocking to me, right? Like when I realized I'm at Google, I went to MIT, I've seen pretty much the best of the best as resumes call it. Uh, I'm like, none of them are as good as that guy. And no one sees it past his resume, which is crazy. Because software engineers are literally the most sought after profession, right? Like there's nothing else. Everywhere you look is like data scientist, software engineer, full stack engineer. Every statistic you look at is the most high demand job. And then there, you've got somebody who literally can't get an interview because their resume says they're not qualified. And this realization actually led to starting of the company called Signal, which in the beginning, it was more of a, like, we have to fix this, right? We have to find a way to make sure that if people are qualified, if people can actually do the job, they're given the opportunity to do so. And they're at least given the chance to interview for it. Uh, later on, it, I actually started like digging more and more and realized there are two fundamental forces that are making resumes impossible to sustain. Uh, the first force is actually uh, education. Because if you go back 30 years, in the early 90s, how else would you become a highly qualified engineer? I mean, internet was not a thing. There was no like Stack Overflow, GitHub, all sorts of online educational resources. So the only way you could actually gain the skill and have the education to do this, if you went to one of these institutions that was teaching it, or you were associated with one of the companies where you could get some mentorship. So if I looked at your resume and I found neither one of those on your resume, it wouldn't be too far off to say you probably do not have the skill. But in the last 30 years, you've seen everything change. Because of internet, because of educational revolution, because of the democratization of education, you see, I mean, University of Central Missouri granted more CS degrees than MIT, Stanford, and Harvard together combined just last year. 
you see every university publish their courses for free. Literally, you can go on like MIT OCW, Harvard edX, and it's just all for free. All of the lectures recorded, available to learn. I mean, you can get on YouTube <laughs> and literally learn anything you want. So that notion that unless you're associated with one of those few educational resources, you're not qualified is gone. Now, on the other hand, the second force is demand. Okay, back then, uh, demand for highly skilled engineering talent was not this high. Over the last 30 years, as technology has been eating the world in every aspect, you've gone from, yeah, we just need a handful of those engineering people to everybody's hired. Like every company is a software company. Uh, from Starbucks, which is right here, to Macy's, to Costco, everybody is literally trying to reinvent themselves as a software company. And the pandemic only accelerated that because due to the pandemic, you have everybody realizing this digital transformation thing that everybody has been talking about actually is not a next 10 years thing, it's like right now thing. And the people building that digital transformation are those engineers. And everybody is still so concentrated on looking for resumes that fit this standard model. Uh, and it turns out that's only like less than 3%. So the whole pool that's available, less than 3% have a resume that says, oh, here's a flashy name that you recognize on my resume. And fighting for those you know, very, very limited resources is leading to the situation in which uh, everybody is just like recycling, literally, right? Like you go from Google to Uber, Uber to Facebook, Facebook to Google, and it's just this like dance where you know perks are running out and salary inflation is hitting a crazy point. Uh, but even with those two forces, it's interesting how difficult this kind of a change is. Because you would imagine like, if there's such a massive force pulling us in that specific direction, there should be like, an easy and instantaneous jump into this market, but it's not. Because resumes, I mean, have been a part of how we've done this for a long time. Some people say the first recorded resume is like uh, Leonardo da Vinci who wrote to the Duke of Milan that he can build cannons that can demolish his opposition. There's literally like there's a paper of that <laughs> where Leonardo da Vinci is listing out all of his uh, credentials on a resume. But in reality, resumes became a thing more around the 1940s and 1930s after the Great Depression where everybody was trying to find a job and you had to somehow, you can actually Google and find pictures of people having posters standing outside that says, you know, I can speak two languages, I'm this tall, I can lift this much weight. That's literally the first version of the modern resume. Uh, from there, we've kind of transitioned to, you can say LinkedIn being the resume 2.0, because LinkedIn is essentially the modern resume. It's a little bit more standardized, it's a little bit more, harder to say things on it that others wouldn't be able to like call you out on because there's a social network component to it. But the essence of it, that you're just listing out educational institutions you're associated with or companies that you worked at hasn't quite changed. It's pretty much the same thing. And the belief is that we can actually make that transformation and we have to. It's just a matter of time of like, how fast can that transformation happen? Because any year that that transformation doesn't happen to a system in which it's more about skills, it's more about ability, it's more about potential of doing the job versus a list of institutions that you're associated with, every year we don't do this, there's like a whole generation of people who are actually struggling to live up to their full potential. And then there is the reverse, if you think about it, right? Because right now, if I am a student in my you know, junior year of college, and I look around and I see that what's being recognized is pedigree, it takes a lot of work to get highly skilled at anything. Right, like it's, I mean, some Malcolm Gladwell says it's 10,000 hours of practice. And to put 10,000 hours of practice and get good at something, you have to know that the reward is at the end of that journey. When you look at it and you're like, uh, you know, why do this, all this work? The only way to get that recognition, to get that success, is to have the pedigree. You see university admission scandals <laughs> because parents would rather try to bribe university officials and get that stamp 
And on the other hand, you have literally free educational resources. As I said, MIT publishes all of its lectures online. Very few people take advantage of it. It's kind of crazy because it's not the skill, it's not the education, <clears throat> it's the diploma, it's the prestige that tends to matter today. So where am I going with this? Skill assessments has to come part of this, right? And skill assessment has to be done in a way where you do not necessarily you know, concentrate only on the thing that I can do today is the thing that I can do tomorrow. Because predicting potential, actually, not measuring just what I can do today is like a huge, huge component of it. Because if you only measure what I can do today, you're most likely stuck in uh, what opportunities have I had to be able to get to this point. So the combination of what can you do today and what are you going to be able to do a year or two from now by measuring the progress that you've made over time is a fundamental shift in thinking of how we do this. And the, the problem with only focusing on resumes is not only that you, know, you don't encourage the future generation to do this, you don't actually give opportunities to people who can do this today, you also demotivate the future generation from trying to do this. And what could signal we've made a lot of progress in this direction. For example, last year we published a university ranking, a new way of ranking universities that's based on the actual skill set of the students. And guess what? It turns out that the belief that you know, if you went to MIT, you're amazing. And if you went to uh, unknown school like University of Central Missouri, you're not qualified, turns out to be completely false. Every school has their great, their average, and their bad. Sure, if you look at the you know, median or the curve, there is some shift left or right, right? Because obviously, some of the best schools get the some of the best high school students, so they get the selection bias from the get-go. But the notion, but the notion that you know, only the students that went to this specific school are qualified and the ones that didn't are not qualified, we already debunked that. Like number two school on our list was University of Miami. Everybody was like, what? How is University of Miami a second? None of us go to recruit from University of Miami, but that's what the data says. And these kinds of data points are what can enable us to actually make this transformation. But just us pushing this is not going to be enough. Like, it's going to take way more than one company to change something that's been around for 100 years. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take you all thinking about, like, how do I go back to our companies, to our communities, and push to go beyond resumes movement forward because at the end of the day, talent is the most precious resource humanity has. And if we're not cherishing it, if we're not growing it, if not, we're not discovering it, if we're not developing it, we're literally not going to be able to make the transformations that we need for the future. Thank you all. Appreciate you being here. <laughs>